What's up everybody? Welcome back to the Next Level channel. Hope you guys are all having a great Monday. I know I am. Just got back from Colorado, did some riding, and we are talking about clutching. You guys, we did an episode on clutching where we kind of just touched the surface. Now we're going to dive into it even deeper. Let's get into it. You guys, we watched these guys pulling these off. We've got, some, we've got some tips and tricks in terms of getting our primary and secondary clutches off. This is so great for me, learning so much about clutching in terms of just all of these tips and all these things that these guys know. So you guys, welcome back to the channel, Dustin, Jared. I'm gonna let you guys talk a little bit about your background and why you guys are here helping me with this clutching video. Go for it. Yeah, for sure, Dustin Panker. I work for Klein, but as you know in the previous video, I spent 18 years working at SLP which uh, was great to get the experience tuning and, and uh, learning how to you know, do everything we can to optimize our power and get the power to the ground. And so clutches are a big part of that. And it's, there's a lot that we can go over that'll just help us learn those little tips and tricks and things that can make that performance a lot better and get better durability and longevity out of our components. Yeah, it's so great to have you. I mean, years of experience. I mean, the, the manuals that we can get and we can just go online, it seems like you can ask Google for just about anything, but you guys with the things that aren't in the manual, the tips and the tricks that you don't always get to read about, it's great to have you guys here and kind of showcase into our viewers just all those little hints. So Jared, go for it. Yeah, I'm Jared Sessions. I've been in the snowmobile industry for like 25 years, mostly specialized in the high performance aspect, you know, turbos, nitrous, pipes, and all of that stuff requires some pretty heavy clutch tuning along with ECU <clears throat> calibrations, jetting back in the day, and you know, I'm pretty excited to be involved in this and uh, have a lot of experience with hill climbers, backcountry riders, the top guys in the industry, just making their stuff go fast, perform day in, day out, you know, and give them what they want out of their sled. Yeah, both of you guys, throughout my career as a snowmobiler, you guys have had your hands on my snowmobiles every single season. And because I don't know a bunch about this, like I really do soak up all this information. You guys know how to take what I'm feeling as a rider and turn that into something fast. Like I, I think I have a good idea of what works, and, but I don't know all the, you know, the dynamics to all of it. And it's really fun. And it's been a, a huge benefit in my life and my career to have both of you guys as resources to help things get, get better as we go. So that's been great. All right, so earlier we were talking about the belt and how this can play a huge role in terms of overall performance of the sled. We kind of got this cleared up. Now let's go through, as you guys can tell, we've got everything kind of pulled apart thanks to these guys and their handiwork. But now let's go through the specifics. So let's talk about all the things that are adjustable between both the primary and secondary. Let's talk about the weights, Dustin. So dive right in, tell us about weights, why weights are important, and what about them as we adjust them leads to performance of a snowmobile. Yeah, so there's lots of variables with weights. Some people refer to them as ramps or arms. There's <laughs> different names, right? But this one here is an aftermarket SLP uh, weight and it's adjustable so you can take these little set screws and add more mass or weight into the arm itself so it's, it's center drilled with threads and you can add these in with a special little tool right and so the weight is one of the factors that controls the rpm your peak rpm so the motor will make peak torque and horsepower at a certain RPM, and the goal is to get the calibration to allow the snowmobile to shift up to that peak RPM and then stay there regardless of the load on the motor, right? So if you stand it up and you, you come down into a drift and it loads the motor really hard, these clutches need to shift to try to keep that RPM at that given point. So for example, on this machine, it's gonna be like 8250, right? Right. So we're gonna adjust the weight of this arm so, so for example, if we're over revving, say we're hitting 8350 or 84, we want to add weight to pull that RPM down. Vice versa, if we are uh, under revving, RPM, say yeah. we're 7900 RPM, say we go up in altitude and we start to lose power and we start losing RPM, I can take weight out of this arm and then see that RPM come back. And as we talk about adjustability, 
Is this the most common adjustment that people will make? And where do you guys see most people fail in terms of are more, more than likely are guys that are coming out west riding for the first time, are they riding and they've got too much weight in their sled and they're actually under, under RPM from peak RPM? Yeah, the guys coming from out west, you know, their sleds make more horsepower, or back east when they come out west, their sleds are making less horsepower now and they're, you know, they need a heavier weight to make that peak torque and RPM. And so now when they come out here, they're under weighted. I mean, I guess they're overweighted, and so now they need overweight. Yeah. So they're, they're 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 up at high elevation, and these guys are running at 7,800 RPM when peak RPM could be 8,250. Or you guys would refer to your manual of each different OEM, right? Yeah. But we're trying to find peak horsepower speed. is this the most common things in terms of when we're talking about making adjustments to get to that peak RPM? Is the weight the most common? Yeah. For you know, sure. In the OEMs, they've kind of designed it so that all of the components can mostly stay the same and as you go up in altitude and you lose horsepower you can just change the weight and leave everything else the same generally a rule of thumb is one gram per thousand feet ah. that's a general rule it's not always the case but as you go up in altitude you need to take one gram away and so if you start looking at some of these aftermarket guys you know you'll see their clutch sheets for their aftermarket pipes or whatever and they'll have a zone so it'll be like zero to 3,000, three to six, six to eight, eight to 12, right? Or maybe they'll do zero to two, two to four, whatever. Yeah. But in, you'll notice a lot of times in those zones, it's a two gram difference or three gram difference per zone. Yeah. And it just so happens to be that that's about the same as the altitude change in thousand feet. Right. So I can go from six to 8,000 feet, have a setup, and then if I'm gonna go to eight to 10, I might just pull two grams and I will still spend the same RPM so that's kind of an easy way to think about it a lot of times, at least in a naturally aspirated world. Yeah, for sure. And what is cool about an adjustable weight is you can make this adjustment really quick and easy. Otherwise, in an OEM standpoint, you have to physically change this arm two taking grams away. at a time, taking weight away or adding. So these adjustable ones allow you to do that one gram increment or that two gram increment or the three or whatever you need to get to your RPM. So. These are a pretty cool tool in the aftermarket world and the collecting world for sure. All right, so when we talk about weights, OEM versus aftermarket, um, let's say this is a 64 gram weight. Is a 64 gram weight SLP the same as a 10 series 64 Polaris weight? N not necessarily, no. So even though they might weigh the same on a gram scale, they may not act the same. Even though the overall mass is one factor in how it's gonna control the RPM, but I remember when we first started playing with the MTX weights when I was at SLP, we would have to add four grams to get it to control the RPM the same way a uh, comparable Polaris weight would. And that's because of the way the mass was in the arm and, you know, the heel height in that way. So no, gram for gram aftermarket weights versus OEM weights won't always act the same. So it's important to have a knowledge of, you know, maybe ask somebody that or test it and then you can fine tune where you need to end up with the total mass of the arm. Which would be another benefit to the adjustable weight. Because if I walked into SOP or anywhere and said, look, I, I just came from sea level, my sled has a 68 gram weights in it, just a stock OEM 10 series 68, and I'm gonna go to Colorado, let's say, and ride at 11,000 feet. If I ask them for two or three grams less of a weight, is that the right move or how do you start that? Like what's that conversation? If look it's like? the same series of weight and brand, then you could probably do that. You can just come down a couple because they come in sets of two. Sets right? of two. Sixty-eight right. to sixty-six is sixty-fours and down the line. Okay. But if you're going to change brands, then you need to have an understanding of how it's going to affect the overall shift, shift curve, and you're going to need some more knowledge. Exactly. I mean, you can take this same sixty-four base weight, and if you were taking your adjustment screw or your set screw and moving all the way to the tip, this weight is going to shift totally different at the same sixty-four grams because now it's got this, you know, it's gonna be act a little bit light, you're not gonna get the belt squeeze off the initial, but then you're gonna get this crazy upshift, pull the RPM down, you know, because of this weight upshifting so hard, but Makes then you sense. move that weight just back to the middle, and now all of a sudden it's kind of halfway between that, you know, big squeeze, now you're gonna get a little bit more upshift in the mid-range, and then you're gonna stay light on the overall RPM. So you can, this aftermarket stuff, really fine tune your stuff. So. Man, so basically what you guys are both telling me is that not all weights are created equal, especially between the OEM and the aftermarket. And then even the weights themselves, whether it's aftermarket or OEM, it is important to check each one of your weights. Like it's not the worst idea to lay these on a gram scale and just see how bundled they are together. That's gonna lead to, well, the clutch being uh, balanced, which is probably also gonna lead to belt wear and tear. So things like that all have and play a role in 
performance of the sled. Exactly. Absolutely. You know, and it seems like it's really crazy. As the last few years have come along, there's been a lot of advancement. Weights have been the same forever, and they're really similar now, but there's all this you know, fine tuning stuff now. So there's some pretty cool weight options out there right now. Well, and in that fine tuning and performance is where you live. Oh yeah, for sure. And there's yeah. a lot of ways to get the same end result. So there's a lot of cool things out there for sure. That's why we could turn this video into hours uh, of just going through all oh, the variables. Yeah, hours. Yeah. All right, so we've, we've gone over weights. We've talked about that. We feel good about it. Let's go into the springs, both secondary and primary. Why, why should we make changes from the OEM and then out of those changes, leading into performance. So what about, we'll just talk with the primary spring. What do we do with that and why? So with the primary spring, you got two numbers that usually most people, you know, interact with. We've got a poundage, which is a certain compression, you know, measure, you know, certain weight measured at a certain compression. And then you got a full shift compression. And so it usually translate into a start rate and a finish rate. And you're going to see the 120, 340, which is a, you know, weights of force at a certain height you know, on the spring. And so the first number is kind of your engagement. Um, the, so when you the, first feel that sled go. Yeah, right, right when you go to engagement, so the weight has to overcome the spring. And so if you have a really stiff spring initially, you know, your weight's gonna be held back, held back, and all of a sudden the spring's gonna let the weight go and you're gonna get this clunk or this lurch. And you don't really want that, you know, you want a good positive belt squeeze. In my opinion, you want stuff coming in smooth, um, you know, and you want a nice solid RPM to where you're not slipping the belt, you're grabbing the belt and, you know, making the advancements you want, you know, forward with the spring. So. And would there be a different scenario racing, so guys that are hill climbing or just real competitive drag racing, something like that, versus mm -hmm. somebody that's just a backcountry rider? Mm -hmm. Like, when they're feeling the sled and they want to know, you know, about engagement, they want to know, you know, how it's going to shift, how much of that in the primary spring plays a role? You were just talking about you know, your, your, your intro weight versus the finish, like what would you do in, in the case of a drag race or somebody that just wants all that power right off the line, how different is that in terms of spring rate? Well, so like in a drag race scenario, you would want a pretty high engagement because you want your RPM to build pretty quick. So you'd want it to lurch out there, but now you want this crazy upshift because you only have a certain distance to get to your top speed. And so generally speaking there, you start with a pretty high engagement to get you the launch. And then once you've got your launch and your RPM, now you're gonna, let them softer. Yeah, go softer on the finish. That way it can shift out and get to your full shift potential. Like in the mountains, you would want a little bit higher because you're going to be running in a different, you know, track speed. So your pulley ratio is not going to be shifted all the way out. So you, you know, to control, this also controls your peak RPM too and your final shift out of your weight. So, and then, and yeah. also this is, you know, controls back shift too, because if you have a super soft spring, you might get out there and then you go to get out of it and get back into it and it's not going to recover because your spring is too soft. All right, so we've, we've definitely explained what the primary spring does. It's a wear item. Uh, oh, yeah. About how many miles, to those that are watching, they're looking at this thing and they're like, oh yeah, that's, that's what I need to get. About how many miles or what kind of abuse on the snowmobile before we know we need to change out our primary spring? Depending on your horsepower, definitely can, you know, take a toll on your spring and the rates, you know, the, the higher finish rates and the higher start rates seem to fatigue a little bit easier than some of your softer springs. Um, you know, me being a performance guy, if I let a spring go any longer than 500 miles, I know I'm suffering performance. I'm a, you know, I'm a way on top of my performance game. So I'm like every 250 mile, I'm replacing the primary spring, not as much on the secondary, but the primary takes a lot of abuse. And so this one I'm changing quite often. So. And it's a, a, it's an easy one to inspect while the sled or the, while the clutches are in the sled. But oftentimes I've seen those where they've been broken and then, or they're fatigued so bad that you can't really tell visually while it's in the clutch, so important to do what we've done here and actually open up the clutches and take a peek. Yep, for sure, and this is, you know, definitely a, you know, if you get a really low engagement, could potentially have a broken spring or a coil off, or if you got no RPM on the top end and really lays at the bottom, you know, definitely could lead it to a broken spring. You know, this spring is also, you know, you can kind of look at it like Dustin was saying with the, you know, the weight, as far as one gram equals a certain amount of RPM, the spring is the same thing. You know, if you go 10 pounds stiffer on the start rate, you're gonna get about a hundred RPM increase on your engagement. Wow. And the same on the finish. And if you're just fine tuning the thing and you just say, man, I like the way this weight feels, but I need a little less or a little more, you know, on my finish RPM, taking 10 pounds, yes, yeah, you could do it with, it. you know, a spring 10 pounds less or 10 pounds more would give you that 100 pound, I mean that 100 RPM difference on the big end too. So, wow.
talk the secondary. Secondary. So the, the theory in general is similar, um, but the secondary is a little bit more, I mean, at the end of the day, we're trying to get belt squeeze, right? Um, slippage is gonna create heat. Um, so if we can adjust the components to create a consistent belt squeeze, regardless of the input from the track or the input from the motor. So the motor is driving the primary clutch, right? And then the primary clutch is transferring via the belt to the secondary, and then the secondary goes and is attached to the track, right? Yep. But if I slam on my brakes really fast, now the track is inputting how the secondary works, right? If the, if the primary clutch is trying to drive the secondary, and then all of a sudden I grab the brakes, that track's gonna try to slam that clutch the other way. Right. And that's where the spring comes into play because the spring is holding side pressure on the belt, okay? Yeah. While at the same time, it's also providing resistance against the up, upshift from the helix. So we can, we can tune some of the shift by using the spring to provide resistance against that upshift. So your Makes helix and your sense. spring have to work together. You really almost can't have one without the other. Does that? If, yeah, it's kind of hard to imagine the picture in your head. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense though. But you can generally tell if you're soft on your spring because you'll start to feel that belt slippage yeah. or it won't, wanna, it won't wanna maintain RPM versus if you're too stiff on your secondary spring, generally what'll happen is it'll feel really revvy um, and it won't wanna upshift very fast. Okay, okay, um, yep. And it takes a little bit of seat time and experience to feel that. Like you have to kind of almost like purposely calibrate one wrong and feel how that feels, and then you go back. Be wrong so you could feel yeah. something yep. that's right. Yep, so the other time that we really talk about secondary spring is back shift. So if I'm a hill climb guy, say I'm a competitive hill climber, and I've got a bunch of screws in my track and a really cut down track, and I have really, really good traction, yeah. and I'm hill climbing, and I need to come out of a corner, out of a trench really fast, and get on and get off the throttle, yeah. I yep. want a spring that's so stiff that it's gonna be right there, right now. Yeah. Right. You see these guys, yeah. they're, they're wide open to the bars, to a gate, and then they're locking up the brakes completely, yep. turning the corner, and then boom, they're right to so the So that clutch is just again. slam one way, slam the other way, and if we don't have a stiff enough spring in there, it's gonna let the engine bog. Because yeah. it's getting really good traction really fast, right? And also, you know, the spring with out the brake, if you come into a corner and don't use the brake, you could be caught in the wrong gear if you don't have a stiff enough spring because the brake does help with back shift, but if you don't have the right spring, you know, if you have too soft it's of a spring, be lazy you're gonna be in the wrong out. gear coming out that's if you're not yeah, using the brake. That's kind of how I look at it too. You know, the brake will usually set a back shift, not always, but that's the quickest way to get a back shift, but you don't always want to have to grab the brake when you need a little more back shift. You can always do that with a little more spring. And equally important to the backcountry guys, since most of these guys watching this are wanting to know about you know backcountry snowmobiles and backcountry performance, I can see how that all comes into play even still, right? You're in the trees and you come to a complete stop, say you're downhill and you want to just get on it and turn that side and go back uphill, the back shift to the snowmobile and having that spring rate I mean, that's just as important to, to that guy, you know, versus just the racer, right? Sure, and it's a catch-22 because if I'm a performance guy and I'm trying to accelerate as hard as I can, maybe I'm gonna throw a little higher angle at it. Yes. Which is great, now I'm accelerating faster, but that's also gonna affect the way the spring works too because now the spring might feel soft. Yeah. So finding that combination of how they interact together is, that's like the tricky part, right? These two are both smiling at me because <laughs> There is no way that we can cover every variation to clutch performance, right? It just, I mean, there's so many parts. There's so many adjustable parts. We talk about the things that are simple and the things that most people are going to adjust. But once we start diving into, you know, helixes, custom angles, those types of things, I mean, it is kind of endless. But we're giving people mm -hmm. as much as we can without going into, you know, so much detail. Exactly. The OEMs do a pretty good job of giving you a pretty yeah, good perfect. base setup that you just have to make one component change. But then you, you know, once you start adding aftermarket stuff and more performance, or you want just a little different feel out of your sled, you can kind of start to dive into a few of these things. I wouldn't dive into everything at once. Maybe one, you know, component at a time. Obviously, the primary is the easiest to work on. You can get a lot of places there, but the secondary played a pretty big role. Like, awesome. You know, you're climbing a hill, you hit a little rise, you're still full throttle, your RPMs come down, and they don't come back as fast as you want. That means your sled didn't back shift, you're stuck in the wrong gear. And that's gear. an adjustment that yeah. can be made. Can you be don't made. have to just live with it, right? Yeah. Spring will help that, but then there's also the time that the helix will do it, but the, the spring is the easy first. Yeah. And there's, there's, a, there's a few tricks 
there's like kind of, you know, we did our list of five things that we talked about before. Yeah. Well, there's the same thing that will kind of apply here. Okay. Right? That's, so that's great. Let's break this down because everybody loves lists. Let's talk about in terms of clutch performance. And I know we did it before. It was kind of generalized in terms of some, let's say a little bit more of this technical tuning aspect. What are those five things? We, we, so would consider, fun, we have not talked yeah, about so five, five, <laughs> five tips and things in terms of what's sitting on the bench right here in terms of, you know, all these guys are, they're interested in how not only to have a great performing snowmobile, but all these guys, including all of us, we all want to beat our buddies. Like that's the whole general rule of, rule of thumb with a snowmobiler is like, I want a, a really rad ripping sled, but guess what? It doesn't matter how much motor I have. If I can't, and are not willing to, to dive into the clutching part of it, yeah, I'm not it putting that ground. power to the snow. Yeah. So what are those five? And they don't have to be in any kind of order. So that, for me, number one is, is if you're trying to learn how to tune and you're trying to only change one thing at a time. Yeah. Like that's the kind of the basic on how to understand yeah. what does what. We weren't gonna change do it in order, one thing that is certainly time. a priority. Yeah. If you start one changing thing two at or a three, time. one thing. You yeah. can chase your tail really fast because you like, don't know what did what. It's like massively adjusting your suspension and wondering why, and then you didn't even have a baseline to start with, and now the sled's ill-performing, and you don't really know where to start because you didn't go through that. So one thing at a time. Yeah, consistency, baseline, same belt, you know, make one change at a time, back to back if possible. Okay. It's going to be the best result. All right, so changing one thing at a time, that's our number one. What's our second one? What's our second tip and trick to all things laying on this bench? To me, number two would be you have to start with all components in really, really good shape and know that they're that way. Ah, so just actual wear and tear of all of this stuff. If you're going to start a baseline for clutching, every bit of this stuff you've got to go through and, and make sure that it's all there. You've got a sled that's got a thousand miles on it. Chances are there's some wear and tear items yeah, that should be replaced or cleaned or looked at. If I'm going to start playing with springs and I grab a spring out of a used pile or something like that and it maybe it's 20 pounds soft, I might know what the target ratio is supposed to be, but and so I go put it in and it doesn't act the way I think it would have acted. Just it might be because started I started with a spring that was soft. Exactly. So you have to know your components are accurate. All right. And this spring at 50 miles, it's gonna act slightly different than it did when it was brand new. Just even it, it takes the seat. Even at 50 in. miles. Just all right, so, yeah. so components that are in here, those are all in good, good working order so that we can create that baseline. Yeah. Number three, what do we got? So I think number three is the overall general condition of the clutches themselves. Right, because there are components to this that don't necessarily have to be taken apart, but we certainly have to clean them. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about this in previous videos, just in terms of overall condition. And my gosh, if we pull clutches apart where they are just filthy, they've had a thousand miles of mountain miles getting after it. There's belt dust everywhere. There's, you guys know on Polaris's where the oil reservoir is, oil is bled down over the clutches, mm -hmm. over the belt. So the overall condition or cleaning of the belt, that's a great number three. After yeah, just, every weekend, just to blow these things out, it will go a long way. So just yep. using air and just blowing them out, getting the belt dust out of there. You can see all the grime and the debris. Yeah. We just got back from Colorado and just, I mean, this thing was going pretty hard. So cleaning that stuff. Just a quick example, there's a bushing in that cap that has to ride on that shaft. And sometimes those bushings can eventually wear and that'll affect the way the clutch acts. So if you're trying to tune a clutch with a bad bushing, you're probably never gonna get there because it's never gonna act right. So just that's kind of a little example. So number three, cleaning and inspection of both of these clutches and because they're both wear items and they're what power the sled. Yeah. All right, number four, where are we at? I think a good thing for me anyways is decide what kind of performance you want. What do you expect out of your clutches before you start making adjustments? You know, yeah. Do you want a tree riding rippy setup or are you setting up for drag racing or you're setting up for hill climb? All of those are gonna require a different setup. So I think I would, determine what type of setup I want before yeah. I start making a bunch of changes. So, so number four, identifying goal. the type of riding that you want to do. That's perfect. You're kind of right. your end goal. So. Yeah. And then number five, I'm going to give it to you because I think that this is probably the most common, yeah. right? In terms of overall clutch performance, I mean, it starts with maybe the simplest yeah. and that's going with an OEM belt. I don't think we're here to, you know, to, to, to dog on other, you know, aftermarket companies with belts, but at least having an idea of where to start and it could start right here at the belt. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to run an aftermarket belt, you know, your, these components are going to have to change. It may cost you a little bit more money to run this one initially, but it's going to cost you a lot more if you do change belts because most of these components here are going to have to change to work with that belt. It's awesome. And it's not that those, like you said, it's not that those aftermarket belts are or better or worse. But the calibration has to be matched to the belt specifically. Absolutely. So if, if it is one of the actual calibration pieces that it makes all this work together, you change one thing, it can affect the way everything else works. When you start talking belts, there's you know 
the quick answer is they're different compounds. They could be slightly different in width. So those adjustments are going to change, but mostly it's in the compounds, just how sticky they are, you know, how they break in, how they grab the belt on the sheaths. So, you know, there's some differences there. So, well, Jared, Dustin, you guys, this is, this is so fantastic. I really hope that you guys enjoyed this video. Lots to cover. Doesn't mean that we're even done with clutching because I get it. There's going to be those of you out there that we're excited that we were, we're going to show some of this stuff, how we take these things off, some of the, the cleaning parts of it. Obviously, we went over all of the adjustments that can be made. Is there still more to clutching? And I think that that answer is always going to be yes. These guys are nodding unanimously. You guys remember, we so appreciate all your questions, all your comments. Remember, if you guys like this video, give it the thumbs up. Help to support the channel by subscribing to it. And we will see you next time. By the way, I love your jacket. Yeah, for sure. It's awesome. Keep that in there. Keep recording. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter, winners.